Today's public hearing. Uh, at this time, I would ask everyone please silence or turn off their cell phones so as not to disrupt today's proceeding. Uh, we would appreciate it. The procedure will be to introduce the case record as the Coach Department has it uh, on the wall here and on the screens by means of a PowerPoint presentation. We'll present any um, site plans, photographs, and maps of today's cases, uh, as well as any letters that we've received in support or opposition to a particular case. We'll also uh, uh, introduce any correspondence that we've received from other government agencies. At the conclusion of our presentation, the applicant will come first and present their case to the board along with any persons in support. If there's opposition to a case, the board will then hear from those parties opposed to the case. After the opposition has presented their testimony, the applicant will have a period for rebuttal. In the board's rules, the board provides the applicant in cases without opposition 10 minutes to present their testimony to the board. And in a case that has opposition, each side of the case, both of those persons in support and opposed to a case, have 15 minutes per side to present their testimony. So if you have multiple speakers, please divide your time accordingly before you come up. All section numbers that we refer to today come directly from the Metropolitan Zoning Code, which was adopted by the Metropolitan Council and became effective January 1st, 1998, and applies to the entire jurisdiction of Metro government. I'll introduce and make a part of the record the Zoning Code, and we'll dispense from reading individual sections unless the applicant or opposition requests that those sections be read. The Zoning Code requires that these proceedings be taped. Therefore, it's imperative anyone wishing to address this board, please come forward, identify yourself, and make your presentation. It should be noted that it's found that anyone's presented false or misleading testimony to this board that may have affected the board's decision. Any approval may be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing. The board will go through all cases set for public hearing today, and after each case, the board will discuss and then vote on that case. The board is vested to act... Uh, with the power to act on these cases before us is outlined in section 1740-180 of the Metro Code of Law. The code requires that four members of this seven-member board be present to constitute a quorum. The code also requires that you have four affirmative votes to grant your application. Today we have six members present, so you need four of these six members to vote for your case for the case to be approved. In the event that only four members are present or that there are only four members that hear your case, uh, and you fail to achieve all four of those votes, the case will be reset and re-advertised for the next available public hearing cycle. Uh, in the event there are five or more members present or hear your case, and you fail to achieve four affirmative votes, your case will stay on our agenda for the next 30 days. Uh, and if any of those members who participated do not change their vote, or the members who were not present uh, do not become eligible to participate in your case, your case is deemed denied by operation of law. The applicant or any agreed property owner may request a rehearing within 60 days of this public hearing. Further, an applicant or any agreed property owner may appeal this board's decision to Chancery or Circuit Court within the same 60-day period. After that time has elapsed, the board's decision is final and no further action may be taken. If you're an applicant and your case is granted, it is necessary for you to come and pick up the permit for which you've applied. Uh, you have two years from today's public hearing to obtain such permit for this board's approval to remain valid. Uh, after two years, if you do not pick up your permit, you have to come back and seek approval. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I submit that all cases were filed in proper order. Applicants were notified by certified mail as required by the code. All affected property owners were notified by first class mail, and a legal ad was published in Tennessee and as required by the code. And before I begin, the, the board does allow elected officials to address the board should they wish to. Um, I do see one council member here. Are there any other elected officials present? Councilman, would you like to address the board before the hearing begins? If you like to, you you, you can do either. Uh, okay, all righty. And preliminary announcements, Mr. Chairman, I do have one uh, preliminary announcement. The um, at our last hearing. Actually, let me, let me take that up uh, right after this, um, and I'll come back to that. I'm sorry. Uh, the board has a consent agenda, and a board member reviews the record in prior to each case, uh, and if, in their opinion, the applicant meets the criteria for the uh, relief they've requested and they feel that testimony in the case would not alter material facts, they recommend the case to the remainder of the board for approval. Uh, I'll enter now into the record those cases recommended for consent, and if anyone here is opposed to a case, please raise your hand. 
and we will remove that case from the consent agenda and hear it in its regular order. And the first case recommended for the consent agenda is 2012-43, Mr. David Grisham, 1807 Electric Avenue. Is there anyone here in opposition to the case? Okay. We do have opposition. We'll hear that case in its regular order. The next case recommended for the consent agenda is case 2012-46, HCA Realty, the appellant and owner of the property at 5900 Crossings Boulevard, requesting a variance in the parking requirements uh, to construct a new data center. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 46? Mr. Chairman, seeing none. Um, this is a parking variance. Traffic and parking has recommended approval for it. Uh, the applicant also wishes to utilize the provisions in the code for deferred parking. Uh, should they need the code required amount, they would construct such. And uh, with that, you recommend that case for consent agenda. And then finally, case 2012-47, uh, Ms. Lou Ann Elrod is the appellant. Uh, Burton Elrod, the owner at 5036 Brevity Lane. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 47? Mr. Chairman, seeing none, the, um, the applicant's requesting to construct a new front porch. Um, the irregular shape of this property necessitates the need for variance and uh, the addition actually would, would cause the home to line up with the homes adjacent to it. Uh, there's a plat set back on this particular lot that's much deeper than the adjoining parcels and were they all uniform, she would be able to build this. Uh, also, this addition would allow her to um, save some mature trees on the property. This is really the best place for the construction and again would be in keeping with the other homes. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Whitson was nice enough to review and recommends case 46 and 47 for consent. Okay, so we've got a motion to move the consent agenda. Is there a second? Uh, we've got a motion, a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Passes. If you are here for cases 46 and 47, your cases have been granted, you are free to go. You're welcome to also stay if should you wish to. And thank you. Be sure to follow up with the Coast Department on Monday to obtain your permits. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to call the first case. If the applicant will come forward, uh, each side will have 15 minutes to present their testimony, and the applicant will come forward. Hey, come Joey, first. did you want to handle that other case? Or? Uh, yes, let me do that. No. Remaining members that uh, participate in the case, do any of you all wish to change your votes? No. Yeah. no. Okay. Uh, with that, by operation of law, that case is deemed denied for failure to obtain four votes within 30 days, and a, an appropriate order will be entered on case 15. And. With that, we'll call the first case at this time. Mr. Grisham, are you present? Please come forward. Uh, are there any parties in support for you who wish to speak on your behalf? They can come They can come forward as well and have a seat, gentlemen. I have three seats available for you. Uh, if you'll give me just a moment, we'll go through the, the photographs and case record, and I'll turn it over to you all. Okay, the uh, subject property is located on the uh, north margin of Electric Avenue between um, South 18th Street and South 19th Street in East Nashville. Uh, it is in the RS5 zone district. The subject property you see here is bound in red on the um, overhead zoning map. The area photograph of the uh, subject property is in the area. <clears throat> Excuse me, the nature of the variance request for you today deals with the construction that occurred here 
uh, to put on a front covered front porch in the gentleman's home. The required setback is 39 and a half feet based upon the average of the homes to either side of that. And the applicant's uh, proposed addition is at 25 feet from the property line. That's a variance of 13 and a half feet. Excuse me, sir. Me? Yep. Um, I realize that I have made an error. With that being said, Joey, can we uh, move back to our consent agenda? Uh, with that, uh, before I do that, call for is there any other opposition present to case 43? Mr. Chairman, seeing none, uh, with that, we'll, we'll, Mr. Uh, Whitson's motion for consent uh, stands on the table. I do need another second, please. We've got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Passes. Gosh, you, case 43 is approved. case. <laughs> okay, Mr. Chairman, we'll call the next case. Uh, there are two cases that have been filed here. Uh, if the appellant would come forward, uh, actually uh, come forward, don't quite have a seat yet at the table, uh, but, but please uh, feel free to begin putting together your, your information. Uh, the first case before us, and, and the reason I bring these up uh, together, the, the overall argument, I believe, is identical in both cases. They are two separate sets of facts, so uh, from a motion standpoint, we need to deal with them individually when we get to the time of motions. Uh, but I think you'll find in the testimony of the zoning administrator and, and the appellant that, that the overall argument is identical in both cases. Uh, the set of facts are somewhat different. I'm going to go over uh, each of those uh, first, and then we'll call the zoning administrator up to do that. But the uh, subject property first that we're dealing with, the case 44, is located at the terminus of, of Locust Street. Uh, you see here it's it's bordered by I-65 on the west, and um, it is in the IWD zone district. This is an aerial view of the property that's here. And the the, the issue is that the uh, and not to take take any, Terry's time from him, but the issue is this the the billboard that is here is legally non-conforming. Uh, and it is legally non-conforming as it sits today in its relation to the proximity of other billboards. Uh, that the zoning code provision requires today that there be uh, 750 feet between billboards. This this is clearly closer uh, to an existing billboard, and I will. And it's non-conforming. Its non-conformity is in that regards is too close to other billboards. The applicant is proposing to remove this um, billboard, which is a, I call a static or traditional billboard wood frame. It is mounted upon, if I recall, a, get to the photograph of it, um, five poles or six poles uh, mounted on that billboard. Today's zoning code, it's also not forming that billboards are required to be monopole in construction. Uh, the request is to change this billboard to a digital billboard. Um, the crux of the argument is uh, Metro's position is that they are subject to the spacing requirements under the current zoning code based upon the LED lighting and the means of elimination of this sign. Uh, the applicant has obviously disagreed with that and filed this appeal to come uh, before you. So I want to show you first this site. Um, there was, as you saw in the photograph, in the aerial photograph on the north end of this property, a, another billboard located on this site. That billboard, I believe, and after, it's gone at this point. I believe it was damaged in the recent uh, windstorms that occurred at the beginning of this month or the end of last. Um, but that, that's the nature of this, this location is they wish to change from a static billboard to a digital billboard. Uh, we believe that they are subject to spacing requirements. This is looking at the subject side. This is the end of Locust Street that goes into the subject property. This view is looking east toward Dickerson Pike, the adjoining properties nearby. And then the uh, subject billboard location, I believe, is in the upper left, and the former billboard that also occupied this site on the north end of it, as you see on the ground there. Enjoy the proximity issue is because of those two billboards on the same side. 
that was one of the issues. Yes, um, the the second one. The, the proximity issue you address of the seven hundred fifty feet, the two billboards were on the same site. Uh, initially, yes, sir. And I'm going to check um, a couple other things, make sure that there's not another issue on the south. Uh, there's another billboard south of here uh, that also comes into play. I can't quite pick up the distance on my drawing, but I'll get the site plan on that one. So that's the first case. The second case is, is different in the fact that um, the existing static billboard will remain and a LED component or an LED board will be added to this billboard. This is located at the intersection of 12th and Clinton. I do have, um, for the record, uh, copies of PowerPoints that the applicants provide and I'll, I'll display them during their time. This is the billboard that you see on the aerial photograph here. The old Marathon Motor Works is just west of that. That new uh, redeveloped area there, and this is this is differs in the fact that they're adding an LED component to this existing billboard. Uh, our position again is they are subject to the spacing requirements that that the zoning code requires of them for LEDs. Uh, they're obviously arguing to the contrary. But this is the billboard in question at that site, and views looking north on the upper left photograph, and then views south um, in the adjoining properties, which you see there. This this spacing requirement is between uh, existing monopole billboards along the interstate. Uh, 750 foot spacing required between the two. Yeah, Linda, can I get case 45 if you've got that one? Do I have it? Taylor, let me let me correct myself. On this particular billboard at 12th and Clinton, the nonconformity in it is raised that the uh, the LED sign is too close to residentially zoned property. It's 788 feet to the south and 760 feet to the north, and there's required to be 1,250 feet. Um, again, the applicant's position they are not subject to those requirements based upon uh, TCA. And then running back to the uh, Locust Street case, uh, the issue there is its distance also to residential, but uh, distance to other static billboards and digital billboards within the within the area. Look at taking this site plan to give you some numbers on these numbers listed here. Proposed billboard location, our code requires that LEDs be 2,000 feet from any other LED billboard. Uh, the the uh, digital billboard being proposed um, here will be um, 1,257 feet to the nearest digital billboard. So it would be too close to that. It's also its distance to the residentially zoned property is at its closest point. Um, appears to be 577 feet to some residential property located here. So that's the, the distance you're looking at there is 577, 1257. And let me correct my, my mistake here. I see that on the plan now. The uh, billboard that's proposed to remain is the one on the south parcel. This billboard here, according to the applicant's drawing, is going to be removed. And the one that was destroyed uh, and replaced would be this one on the north end of the property, according to their site plan. Members, any questions of me before I turn it over to the zoning administrator? Jim, we, Sir. Th this may not be the right time to ask this, but it'll just help frame my brain. But is Metro's argument different in this case from Metro's argument in the case we heard in July or the one that Metro withdrew in August, or I believe we also had another case in October with Lamar? Has Metro's argument changed? And I'm just, yeah, yeah I guess that's my question. 
Well, I'll say I'll let Terry cover that too when he comes up. Now, overall, in the positions between uh, going back in time chronologically, the the case at which is currently before the Chantry Court at Corky's dealt with an issue there where the underlying base zoning did not permit billboards at all. Um, basically, in that case, um, a permit was issued by our office uh, believing that it did conform with state law and we issued the permit. We subsequently revoked the permit uh, upon advice of counsel. That revocation came to this board. Uh, the board um, found that the coach department should not have revoked the permit and Metro appealed that decision to court. Um, in the one prior to that, uh, I believe uh, an argument by Richardson Outdoor Advertising was that applicant in that case. And the board found that the that, well, the zoning administrator in that case believed that the change of from one billboard type static to an LED required them to conform to the uh, requirements that are being discussed here. So the argument from Metro's side, it, it not changed. The zoning board felt that the zoning administrator erred, overturned it, uh, said that the board could be converted to digital. Metro then filed suit against the board. The applicant in that case withdrew their request and replaced it with a tri-panel billboard, which is considered static. Um, so I hope that answers your question. It, it, it does. So from an intellectual standpoint, Metro's making the same arguments again, and the status of those cases is one, we ruled in favor of the applicant and Metro appealed our decision. And then the other one, we ruled in favor of the applicant and Metro is currently appealing our decision again. Is that? Yes. Okay, okay, great, yeah, thanks. The, the, the most recent which is still being adjudicated. Okay, well thank you, that's very helpful. All right, with that, any other questions, I'll uh, turn it over to the Zoning Administrator now and um, he'll have uh, 15, uh, 15 minutes to present his testimony and then followed by the appellants in the case. And before you today in the acting capacity as Metropolitan Zoning Administrator. Um, Mr. Whitson, your line of questioning is exactly on target. It does uh, cover this case uh, very, very much like uh, the prior case that was before you concerning the Richardson Outdoor Advertising and the site at Bell Road, uh, which was a spacing issue if you were proposing to convert the static billboard to a digital board. And uh, I have written a letter, uh, it's in your packet, um, to address the uh, position of the uh, department. But it is based, uh, as it was with the Richardson Outdoor Advertising case, upon an opinion issued by the Department of Law, uh, which uh, their position, I think that, that letter, although there have been some fine fine line changes uh, over time in their position. That letter started in, I think it was December of 2008 is when that opinion was originally issued. Uh, but the spacing issue is the crux of the matter. Uh, the legal department's opinion uh, and their advice to us uh, from December of 2008 until today is essentially that if you propose that if you have a legal non-conforming static billboard that you can replace the legal non-conforming static billboard either voluntarily or involuntarily uh, based upon the uh, protections afforded that use under 137208. But if you go to a digital type billboard, if that's your proposal, then the legal department's advice and, and our position before you is that uh, it is subject to the spacing requirements set forth for digital billboards. Um, that's uh, that's the position we've taken. That's what brings the case before you today. And I would imagine that uh, I believe most of you were, if not all of you, were present during the 
uh, prior case with um, Richardson Outdoor Advertising, uh, the board actually found in favor of the uh, appellant in that case. And then subsequent to the board's action, Metro Legal did file uh, an appeal uh, to court of that decision. Uh, the appellant subsequently withdrew their application and changed it to a, a tri-panel board, which was allowed uh, and treated the same as a static board. So the same issue is back before you today. And it, it deals strictly with the spacing elements as Joey described them to be. Um, have, you have to be 2,000 feet from another digital board. You have to be and I'm sorry, and I don't recall, and Joey's not here, it's 750 or 1,000 feet from another static board. But a digital board also has to be um, uh, 1,200 feet from a residential use. And that's in play in both of these as well. So that particular element is somewhat different than what was before you uh, with the uh, Richardson appeal. Uh, but the 2,000-foot spacing distance is the same as the Richardson appeal. Mr. The 1,200-foot spacing is a new element. Can I ask you a question about this? As in my law practice, I've only handled one billboard case and actually dealt with spacing between billboards. And I know that's a very complex uh, legal question. But let's get into the public policy questions of 2,000 feet, 1,200 feet. What's the reason for that, and why has Metro in the past appealed these rulings of ours? Um, I, I don't know if I can begin to explain why Metro has appealed these decisions. It's the Metro Legal Department's okay, position. Okay, well, that's probably an unfair question to ask. Uh, and it was their action, not, not the department's action, nor the board's action that started sure. the appeal. Uh, in fact, um, for Metro to appeal its own ruling is a pretty unique circumstance. Pretty rare. Pretty rare. Uh, pretty rare. Mm -hmm. and, and in my 22 years with the coach department, I think I've only seen it those times that's been described. Oh, what a fine group of people we have here, yeah. overturned by our own government. I, I <laughs> We're groundbreakers. I understand there may be two other examples of where Metro has appealed a decision of one of their boards uh, or commissions. Uh, one time I think was with the Traffic and Parking Commission, and I don't recall the other one specifically, but they they predate my uh, employment with Metro. So that, uh, so that gives you some idea how rare that. So the 1,200 feet between residential areas, is that because these billboards are deemed to be not good in residential neighborhoods, or why is, it, why is that number so important? Well, that's, that's before you because that, uh, that is a zoning code that was, or an amendment to the zoning code that was added subsequent to the boards becoming legal non-conforming mm -hmm. and having that status. Um, but the legal department's position is that the digital boards are not the same as the static boards, so therefore they're not, digital boards aren't protected. And if you'll remember the prior arguments, and I'm sure you'll hear those arguments today, uh, the arguments were that the land use was for um, a billboard, okay, and without differentiating uh, any further. That's what the zoning code gives the definition of a tip, a billboard as off-premises advertising uh, or outdoor advertising. You've heard it described. The council differentiated subsequent, uh, just a few years ago, they differentiated between the requirements for static boards versus digital boards. And, and it was all about, uh, Mr. Ewing, the impact uh, of digital billboards upon residential areas. So you're saying in this case, I mean, even if we don't agree with the 2,000 square foot distance between billboards, you're also saying that this 1,200 foot rule applies because 
this would be a digital billboard and they're not allowed within the 1,200 feet. That's my understanding of this case. I don't think the 1,200 square foot spacing applies to a static billboard, but it does apply. So if they were to put up a static billboard, we wouldn't be here? That's correct. For either one of these? And I think if they were to put up a tri message tri-panel, we, we wouldn't be here either. Here. The, the council ruled on that as well. And and get, the spacing is 2,000 between digitals. Yes. Okay. What's spacing between static? Uh, statics are 750. 750. Yes. Okay. My memory is often lousy, but but if if I remember correctly, it was Metro's position that an LED board was a different use, and therefore was not protected under Tennessee statute, and our board ultimately determined that an LED board is still a billboard under Tennessee law and therefore it is the same use and so if I remember Metro saying different use and this board found same use because it's a because it's a billboard a billboard's a billboard's a billboard uh, under Tennessee law and if my memory's wrong, somebody correct me, but I, I'm, I'm just trying to get this down to as fine a point as I can. Yeah, I, mean, I, I remember the Metro uh, legal advisor that was with us the day we heard the Lamar case saying that, uh, you know, a billboard's a billboard's a billboard, and they didn't see a, a difference between static and digital in terms of is it a sign. Um, so I don't know how that... It's use as outdoor, outdoor advertising. Right. So it didn't change use is where we came to. And I'm not saying that was... Outdoor advertising. Yeah. And, and I'm sure not trying to make this shorter than it needs to be. It's just... In my, from where I sit, we keep getting these same cases. We keep ruling the same way. Metro's appealing us, which is fine. That's their right, and we would love guidance from a court. And I'm just trying to figure out if there's any difference in this case and the other cases, because... That, that's, I'm just trying to get it down to its brass tacks. I mean, the one, the one difference that I do hear you talking about is, is the uh, the distance. And it, while you were talking about, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, a grandfather, you know, someone has a billboard. Um, they want to change it over, but, but you know, there's another billboard down the, down the way within 2,000 feet. Um, and is it kind of the case of who gets there first? Um, you know, I mean, how, how are you supposed to, or how should... How do you recommend that we look at these uh, cases where, you know, essentially someone converted first and now we're at being asked to, you know, but just because it's been there, if we believe that the uses are the same, um, are, are we penalizing someone because another billboard converted before this one did? Two sense? things. One, my, my recollection of the case and the board's decision is exactly as, as uh, Mr. Whitson has presented, uh, with one possible caveat being that you're ruling that under state law, a billboard is a billboard is a billboard. Uh, my recollection was also that under Metro law, you were making that determination. Uh, there, was, there was some discussion subsequent to your decision uh, that took place about whether or not the board had the authority to interpret state law, okay? But my understanding of your decision was that under the Metro Zoning Code, a billboard was a billboard is a billboard. And, and that would also be true under state law. The Metro Legal, uh, in filing the appeal, which was uh, ultimately uh, the, the whole issue was, uh, or appeal was a moot uh, appeal and, and it was resolved uh, without clear direction and decision from the court. Um, with regard to the distance requirement on residential from, from a digital board to a residential use, uh, it's pretty much the same as the distance requirement from one digital board to another digital board in that this language in the zoning code was added subsequent to uh, either of these particular billboards gaining legal non-conforming status. Okay. So, what so you're, they're quite similar. They're just two different ways of measuring. What you're saying is the Metro Code does differentiate between a regular billboard and a digital billboard in certain places. The Metro Zoning Code today does. Yes. Yes. And what places are those that 
a digital is mentioned separately as it relates to distance between two digital billboards and then a residence? Is that billboards the only? have to be located 750 feet from one another. Mm -hmm. Digital boards have to be located 2,000 feet from one another. Mm -hmm. uh, but digital boards also have to be spaced 1,200 feet from uh, a residential use. Are there any other mentions of digital boards that are different from a normal digital board outside of those two areas? No, sure, not that I'm aware of. As far as restrictions, I guess. So, you know in the in the section that deals with this is 17.32050, uh, and, and it's actually in the prohibited sign section. Uh, and, and I think it's important. Let, let me read this in the record. It says, um, it says that, um, reading it, 17.32050G, uh, signs with copy or graphics or digital displays that change messages by electronic or mechanical means uh, where the copy graphics and display does not remain fixed or motionless for a period of eight seconds. So there's an eight second provision of these digital billboards. They, they can't flash their messages faster than eight. The council originally passed it as two seconds and they've amended it now to eight. Uh, but it talks about, it says that uh, these, these um, electronic shall not be permitted in these zone districts, and it lists, lists out zone districts where they are not allowed. Uh, this is one of those. It says in IWD, IR, and IG, and I'm, I'm quoting those sections, this is industrially zoned property uh, in the first case, uh, and I believe the second as well. But it says unless, and it gives you, you, can, you cannot have them unless you meet these requirements. And it spells through that uh, based on the height of the structure, you've got to be so many feet from a residential zone. Uh, it says that signs four feet or less in height have to be 100 feet away. And then for each additional foot in height, you have to move an additional four feet in setback. Uh, excuse me, an additional 25 feet from a residential zone district. So basically what we've said is they're not different uses. Uh, I, I guess I'd add to the argument that we reject that, that that the grandfather, what we're saying is, if you want digital billboards, you have a mechanism to come through this board and ask for a variance in the spacing requirements between digitals uh, is, is sort of the second fold argument that, that Metro would offer. But no one's ever done that, have they? No. No, I, you know, before you, we haven't had that case, and, that, and I'm, again, I'm not making the case. That's not the case the applicant's making. And he's obviously saying that TCA protects them. They don't have to meet those spacing requirements. So let's go back to, I'm with Chris. I mean, I think the operative issue, the, the first issue that, or the most important issue here is whether or not, whether or not the use of a digital billboard is a different use than the static billboard they had before, regardless of the, you know, different facts before us and what the law says now. The first issue is whether or not they're, they have the protection of the grandfathering clause or not. I believe you are correct. Okay. And then that is, and then that is the same, the, Ultimately the, same issue. the very same issue that we have every time. Yeah. This is our Groundhog's Day case. <laughs> just well, on. since it is is not a matter of settled law, there is an appeal still pending. Uh, the department's position is today as it was in the prior cases. And and again, since it's not a matter of settled law, I, 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 I don't want to presuppose how you might treat it, but I would think you would look at it very much the same way you've looked at it and acted on it previously. I would like to say that. I'm not being critical of Metro at all. Until a court rules, it makes perfect sense to me that Metro would make the same determination every time until it's settled. And I won't tell you all what I think it would be. <laughs> anyway, what the board can do what the board will do. <laughs> perfect timing, Mr. John Michael. You missed the good stuff. <laughs> Regrettably, and I do apologize for that. Uh, I know that my predecessor in this seat has uh, opined very strongly on some of the grandfathering questions that have been put before this board, whether involving signs or other issues. And as Mr. Cobb correctly noted, we still have items that are uh, pending in the courts right now. Um, certainly doesn't prevent you from taking action, as you know, but uh, it will be interesting to see what we get by way of decisions on those issues since they were both contested here at this level and have been in the courts in the past, too, on related issues or similar issues. The city's position has not changed one bit. To my knowledge, no. So, what's the time frame for a determination? Do we have any kind of 
specifically? Well, I don't believe we have an indication at this time when we would necessarily expect a ruling. And I'm, I'm sorry for that. I know it would be helpful to you if you could build around that. Well, it, it, it's not only that, but I, I think in the best interest of, of the appellant here, from a monetary standpoint and making the investments that they're making, um, this is this puts the board in a position to, whether we make a change in the way we approach this or not, puts them in a, a position of economic hardship, in my opinion, but it also puts the board in a position of making an arbitrary decision contradicting all of the things that we have done to allow them to move forward in an economic manner. And so um, it, it really puts us in a position to create hardship for both parties. Um, and, and so I, I think we all feel like there's just some sort of need for some direction that that, uh, that can, can get these people into a position not to have to make these continual uh, appeals that we, it's going to be hard for us to change the methodologies and the decision making that we've had in, in the past. So um, that's for what it's worth. Any other questions of Mr. Cobb? Okay, then I think we're ready to probably hear from the applicant. Okay, if the applicant can come forward along with any parties in support. Hey, Joey, can I ask a question that I think I may know the answer to? But Certainly. Everything the applicant has submitted is already in the record, correct? That's correct. Correct. Okay. So they didn't say a word. Everything they've submitted is in the record, right? That's correct. Okay. Thanks. Mr. Okay. Chairman, uh, do you wish to proceed with the two members that stepped out for a second? or That would seem like an unwise idea. So, no. I think we better wait for them. Okay. Thank you. Uh, with that, the board will be in recess for a couple minutes. Thank you. The Lamar hearing um, back in, um, it was in August, when Lamar had the same issue on the docket. And I remember Metro standing up and saying, Metro recognizes that 137208 allows for a digital billboard to be put up, um, and we therefore are withdrawing our objection to it. Um, and that was it. Um, we were very surprised when we applied for the building permits on these signs that they were rejected. Um, we had thought that it had been settled on that withdrawal. Um, in, it, in any event, they were rejected, um, and that's why we're here. Um, there, are, there are two things I'd like to start out with just to, to make some corrections so that the record is clear. The zoning now in between static signs as of 1993 requires 1,000 feet. Um, the, all of the billboards at issue here are non-conforming. There was one question, Mr. Taylor, I think you asked whether because one of the signs that blew down, would that make it conforming? It would not because there's another billboard to the south on I-65 that would make it non-conforming. So these billboards are all non-conforming as they stand today. They've been non-conforming since 1984 um, at, the, at the latest. Um, and that is because of the distance less than 1,000 yes, feet or what? Yes, Mr. King, it is less than 1,000 feet, actually less than 750 feet. In 1984, it became 750 feet. There, that's when, at the latest, they became nonconforming. 
um, and nothing has changed since that time. So it's been 25, over 25 years since these billboards have been non-conforming. These billboards have always been up. Um, they have always been permitted by the Tennessee Department of Transportation. There's been no change at all in the sign structures except for ownership with mergers in the business and purchases and, and things of that sort. Um, so really the only issue here is what has been addressed um, by this body already, and that is whether 137208 does apply when we're looking to change from a static sign to a digital sign. Um, these are all signs. Um, the I watched Mr. Murphy, the video from when Mr. Murphy argued before, and I was thinking, is there anything else I could add? And there's really not. Um, the zoning code itself, the Metro zoning code, uses signs and billboards interchangeably. There is no separate definition categorizing a digital sign as something other than a sign, something other than a billboard. They use that definition throughout. So by even the same, the zoning code, the definition is exactly the same. And, and but let me ask you this about being the same. Yes. Isn't there a big difference between a digital billboard and a static billboard or trifold billboard? No. Really? Um, it is the exact same thing in that the use is for advertising. And let, let well, me. Well, I understand that part, but just, you know, one is just kind of a flat screen, maybe lit at night. The other is a digital image that changes and can put all sorts of images on there. It, There's no difference between those two? The means of showing the advertising is different. Yes. I mean, one is electronic and one's not electronic. Um, but what it is used for is exactly the same. It is used for advertising, and that's what the definition that the zoning code uses for billboards. Why do you think there's different rules related to digital billboards versus static or trifold, then, if they're the same? Um, I don't know why. I've never gotten in the policies, and I don't even understand why there's not a set distance to residential of a billboard, of a digital sign. The zoning changes that came in, I think, 2009, maybe, um, or 2010, as it relates to the digital signs, is it's 25 feet for every foot of height. So for every foot of height of a digital sign, there needs to be 25 more feet away from a residential establishment or residential area. Um, I, I, maybe they're trying to say the closer you are to residential, the easier or the farther away you are, the higher. I, I, I did, I, I, I've talked to Mr. Smith about it, and I really don't understand why that's in there. Um, but it is. Um, now, it's our contention that the height and spacing requirements, they have a spacing in the new zoning saying it has to be 2,000 feet away from another digital sign. Um, those are the two issues here. One is the residential, and one is spacing to another digital sign. Now, one of our signs, the one on I-40 in Charlotte, which goes through the downtown loop, there's not another digital sign around. So that's not an issue for that. But time. you're close to the Hope 6 uh, the development, right? They're a residential, yes. um, that is. And Mr. Hargis, would you mind bringing up the, the Clinton Avenue um, PowerPoint? Uh, if you'd go to the next slide, please. Um, and I, the slide that is up here um, shows a from the proposed digital sign. It would be 787 feet to a the closest residential area. Another residential area is 788 feet, and another residential area would be 872 feet. Um, in order to get a digital sign, we could put a digital sign there and meet those, but it would have to be so short that it essentially would be underneath the level of the interstate. 
So obviously a digital sign there would not work, but it wouldn't prohibit a digital sign. Uh, we, we could put a digital sign there, um, but it wouldn't be, um, no one could see it. And it's kind of an arbitrary way that they've, that, that the zoning code is put in. Um, and that's why 137208 is specifically there from the legislature. It is to prevent um, local zoning ordinances from blocking businesses from doing what they need to do. Um, and that is expanding, as you all are aware of 137208, um, keeping their businesses going. There is, we submitted a lot of proof through the affidavit of, of Mr. Smith about the necessity for these digital signs. The static billboards are not economically feasible anymore. They just are not. Um, that is why you are seeing so many of these applications in order to are, are you, are you really saying that a static billboard is not profitable anymore? In a good in location? In, at good locations where they could charge enough for rent, it is difficult because the landowners, their property is worth more. And so they're saying, hey, billboard company, I can get X amount of dollars by developing it or doing this. How we many static billboards have just been torn down recently just because the landowner just didn't want it anymore and they could get more money somewhere else? I don't see a lot of billboards coming down around Nashville. I, I don't either. So they are profitable then? Are they... He's the expert in that. Well, the, the main reason that, that we um, are going to digital signs uh, is for the simple reason that... Uh, Can you speak that, your microphone? Oh, it needs to be turned on. That, okay. It's I turned one, it off. I'm sorry. It's the, uh, if you want to call it the coming thing, it is, it is the cutting edge technology. All of our larger cities have already got these signs, uh, even though I have to admit that maybe Times Square is a is a bad example, but uh, these signs have been up there for years. This is what uh, advertisers, they have a lot of flexibility that the static signs don't have. So our, our uh, marketing strategy is to place these signs in key areas, uh, and, and these are considered key areas. Our competition already has digital signs all around the city that were put up previous to the metro uh, rules, the metro uh, change on digital signs. All these signs were already up. There's probably 12 or 14 of them that went up. Right now we've got three and are trying to acquire these, these two more. So it, it basically, uh, it's not that every sign needs to be a digital sign, but you need to have digital signs in certain areas to cover certain parts of the market. So that's what we're doing. We're, we're spreading out our coverage where we have at least one digital sign on each major artery. And, you know, just from the pure economics, uh, whereas if I have a single face sign that has one customer, if I have a digital sign that can have up to eight customers. Right. I know you'd make more money ma off math, of that. The, the question math. I had was, you know, you said that these weren't profitable anymore. And I, I don't think I, that I, that's correct. Thank you. I probably misspoke. Okay. Um, and where it is is competition is getting more and more intense. And I do think a lot of these signs are becoming non-profitable um, in certain areas. Not all of them, of course, um, in the, the majors. Right. What's really happening is we have... Um, uh, we, we have people that recognize our business as being a a, um, a good business to be in at certain times, and we have people coming into the market that are talking to our property owners and offering them staggering amounts of money. So it's almost to the point that, on the one hand, we're trying to tell them we can't pay that kind of rent. On the other hand, they've got people that are saying that we can pay that kind of rent. So. It, it's come down to a competition thing that we've got to stay in the game or, we, or we're going to get run out of town. So that's the bottom line. That we have to, we have to basically, uh, uh, if, that's, if that's what the demand is, then that's what we have to supply. But the biggest thing is our customers because the, the, um, 
the ways that they can change their copy and the, how often they can change their copy and lack of production cost in this uh, use is, is it's not, there's no comparison, really. And that's the reason that this technology has, has taken over a lot of big uh, areas. Unless I'm confused, will you yes, walk sir. me through what you were talking about? I believe it's Clinton Avenue. Is that when we were talking about a minute ago? The when you were referring to the distances and, and about the height to, to be able to make that a digital, did that, is that what you said, to be able to make that a digital? To, to be able to make it a digital to where you would see over the interstate, it would have to be high enough to where the proportion would not work to a residential area. You're saying it's allowed by zoning? That we're saying that the zoning requires that it would be it, it would have 25 feet away from a residential area for every foot of height. The only way to make that work would it be if the digital sign were below the interstate because of the grade. Um, Mr. Hargis, could you go to the next so that one more, please. Um, there's a picture of what the sign looks like. In order to be short enough, it would have to be underneath where the um, interstate would be. Let me ask you this. If, in your opinion, the digital and the static are one and the same, Yes, sir. are you not picking and choosing which rules or laws you want to go by here now? Why aren't you saying we're entitled to put a full-size sign there in Clinton Avenue digital? Why are you saying that? I'm confused here. Well, under 137208, we are entitled to put the digital sign there. And, and it's not, we're not trying to pick and choose. We're just saying state law has, the legislature passed the law. They're the only ones who could allow municipalities to zone. They can also limit how the zoning is done. They have chosen, the legislature, in passing 137208 to state specifically that a non-conforming use, everyone concedes this is a non-conforming use, right. can demolish and rebuild and expand. Again, as long as the use stays the same. That is why Metro is arguing that the use is different. Because otherwise, it's clear that we could build a digital sign without a problem. So the only way that Metro can prevent the application of 137208 is by arguing that it's a different use. So, so if you, if there were no billboards on on either of these sites, and you were to come to us, you would be asking for a variance for the the distance requirements, either to residential or to the other billboard, in order to put a, a billboard there. But since there are billboards currently there, you're saying it's grandfathered in, and the use is the same, and that's what we want. Yes. Okay. Mr. Asher, yes, sir. I'm just going to try to make this as simple as I can. 17, or, I mean, I'm sorry, 13-7-208 is the grandfathering provision, and a, a court has held that it applies to billboards, correct? Yes. And Tennessee law makes no differentiation between types of billboards. It's just a billboard. Correct. And Metro's own zoning code makes no differentiation between billboards. They're just billboards, correct? Correct. Okay. Then Metro passed some other restrictions to this, you know, LEDs, which is not differentiated from other billboards. They just added on different restrictions. So I've been trying to think of an analogy. Wouldn't this be as if Tennessee law protects single-family homes, period? That's just the words. And then Metro came along and said, well, a ranch is different than a Tudor, is different than a Colonial, is different than anything. But unless Tennessee law recognizes that differentiation, doesn't, I mean, because we all know Tennessee law governs, correct? Correct. Uh, okay, so I really... I mean, to me, this is just 
I mean, no offense. I mean, it's simple. I mean, it's, I, I, mean, I, I agree, and that's why I, I, I wish we could have done a poll before I actually, I didn't want to waive an argument by not arguing. Um, uh, no, no, I'm not trying to cut it short at all, and I, and I don't mean to, I'm not frustrated with Metro. I'm not frustrated with the applicants. I'm not frustrated. It, it's just, but it's the same issue over and over. Yes, sir, it is. And, and I was surprised when our permits were denied on the basis of how Metro withdrew the objections to the Lamar sign um, back in July, and I've included that in the record also just for um, to, pr to preserve that because um, we thought that Metro had at that point said, you know what, we, we kind of give up on this change of use. Um, and so, but the Metro is contending that it's a change of use, um, but this sign is exactly, as you put it, a billboard is a billboard is a billboard. Metro defines a billboard as a billboard as a billboard. Um, there are different rules for different types of billboards, but that doesn't change that Metro considers a billboard to be a billboard to be a billboard. And the law, there was a recent Tennessee Supreme Court case in 2010 not applying to billboards, but emphasizing that 137208 is a very strong statute and that local ordinances do not trump that statute. It's the other way around. So I really, I don't mean to seem frustrated with anybody. It's just until the court rules, we're kind of in this stagnant area and it seems like we're just going to hear a bunch of these cases until the court rules, or, or some anyway, I guess. Um, I guess so, based on Metro's position. Um, I, I, because I don't agree with Metro's position, I think that it, it's not something that should be coming up over and over and over again, but Metro is taking that position, yes. Um, the, we've, we've talked a little bit about how close residential areas are and so on and so forth. Um, all of these areas we're talking about are heavily commercial, heavily industrial. Um, well, the one in front of us is less than 800 feet from a residential housing area. Yes, it is. So that's... Uh, and, and the other areas, Mr. Hargis... So, but you said they were all res, uh, industrial, but this one's not. And that's why we're here. I, no, it, it is zoned IWD. I'm talking about the houses that are nearby, not the actual site of your billboard. Right, and that because... But you said that this was not a... You said it was an industrial area, a commercial area. This area is quite residential nearby. Okay, a couple if, hundred if we homes. could show the overheads of those areas. One more through there, Mr. Hargis, please. These are videos or pictures of that area. One more, please. You could do one more. Well, that's it. Um, how about let's go to the Locust Street one, please? There you go. There's the overhead um, showing the warehouses, the commercial Joey, can, area. Can we go back to the um, one next to Marathon and do that Google map and show where these houses that we're talking about are? the Hope Six houses. They're right there where the arrow is, kind of in the bottom of the screen. Yes. So that's in your, that's less than 800 feet away. That's a, there that's, are hundreds of people that live over there. Yes. It's residential. That area is residential, yes. 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 And that's what my point is. But it's not a residential area. But it's residential. I mean, well, predominantly, the other area over here and over there is residential too. That's um, Hope Gardens. And, and Mr. Ewing, if, if the residential had by chance been, let's say, 300 feet further away, mm -hmm. there would be no problems at all with any of these. Well, I know, well, we understand that, but it's not. So that's why we're here. I think the issue is whether there's a change in the and, and He's asking for a variance. Or. We're, we're not asking for a variance, Mr. Ewing. We're not. Interpretation. This is interpretation. This is an item A appeal. Um, and 
I think Metro raised the issue that what this really should be is maybe a variance, but we're not asking for okay, a variance. Okay, but item A appeal deals with the length of the distance between your sign and these residences. It, no, it, it deals only with the interpretation of the zoning ordinance, and the zoning ordinance is being interpreted, interpreted in this instance to say that these ordinances apply to um, a digital sign because it's different than a static. Right. That, that's the interpretation. And the reason, I, in my opinion, that that is in there is digital signs are deemed differently by our zoning code because they have different impacts on residential areas and static signs. I don't know why Metro has chosen to do it the way they have. But they have. Th they have. And that's why I'm oh. emphasizing the residential part, because that's why we're here. And why we're here is we're saying under 137208, Metro cannot do that to a pre-existing non-conforming use. Okay. I, I just, just to raise uh, our awareness here at the board, one of the very first cases we all heard together was the uh, Bell Road uh, same situation, but it was less, it was like adjacent to the property. I think it was less than 500 feet of an issue of residential. I completely understand that, but, I, but from a consistency standpoint, what is it that we're looking at as far as is this a acceptable non conforming use covered by the, the state law? Is there a change in use? All right, well, that's what we will that's the, determine that, I, I think that's, during our. Discussion and deliberation. We ought, that consistency issue is, is definitely something we need to um, unless consider there, deliberation. Unless there are any other questions, um, I, I think I've answered everything. Um, I've got one yes, question, and, and it's already in your materials, but it's pretty poignant. The Tennessee Attorney General has ruled that you can. In, you can expand the extent. You can expand the activities of the non-conforming use. Correct. Correct. Okay. So, so it, it's not as if the non-conforming use has to stay static. It can be. In fact, it can be taken down and rebuilt. Correct. And it, there are three separate opinions by the Tennessee Attorney um, General that emphasize that under 137208 you can do that. And I've included them in the in the materials. Do we have any other questions? Okay, then uh, close the public hearing and open discussion. Actually, Mr. Chairman, before we do that, um, the side of May appeal, we do allow any other party that wishes to address the board. Oh, okay. Uh, is there anyone else here wishing to address the board? Okay, Mr. Chairman, seeing none, with that, we'll close the public hearing on cases 44 and 45. Okay, thank you. Discussion? Y'all may not know my position, so I'll go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for coming back and giving us a lovey. Uh, okay, my position in a nutshell is that the grandfathering provision of the Tennessee Code trumps Metro. We have a non-conforming use. We have an attorney general's opinion that a billboard falls under this. We have an attorney general's opinion. Actually, we have case law that says it falls under this. We have an attorney general's opinion that they can expand and they can certainly take it down and rebuild it all according to the attorney general. There is no differentiation under state law with respect to billboards. Under Metro's own code, there's no differentiation of billboards, but to me that's not the operative fact. It's really whether Tennessee has a differentiation between billboards, and they do not. I do not get my feelings hurt at all that Metro is appealing this decision because they obviously disagree, but we as a board have ruled the same way three times. So. My concern would be if the board changed its position prior to a court telling us that we were wrong, then we could be accused of acting arbitrarily and capriciously. Oh, oh, is that a motion? No, 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 that, that's, that, that's just my thoughts for the record. I mean, and so, but. I just have to say, yeah, what he said. <laughs> 
mean, truly, that was eloquent. If, if you could it was beautifully that, done. That motion. <laughs> we'll make that motion. I'll second that motion. <laughs> I, I previously did not support this, and I do feel that digital billboards are different from regular billboards, and, you know, clearly they could have a billboard on this site under law but not a digital one. And so I think that's where the difference is, that we're not telling them they cannot put a billboard there, we're telling them they cannot put a digital billboard there. And that part, I don't think, is inconsistent with state law. And I agree, and it, it may be a, they both may be signs, they both, both may be billboards, but to me a digital billboard is more impactful on the surroundings than a static billboard is. And to me, that's an increase in the uh, non-conditional use. So I, and I'm going to come back to words have import. And when, um, when there is a need to distinguish between things, the code makes that distinguish. I mean that distinction. It does not do so in this case. And a use is a use. A change in a, a change in the means of delivery is not a change in use. And so, if it was intended that a change in the delivery of the use was a change in use, it it would give us that guidance. It doesn't. So, for that reason, the use remains the same. It's still a sign and a billboard. And for that reason, Chris, if you'll make that motion with that eloquent... Uh, <laughs> My motion's actually pretty simple. I am going to move um, that the board find that the zoning administrator acted in error, not arbitrarily, but in error. Um, is there a second? I second. Okay, so we've got a motion, we've got a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? No. No. Okay, we better raise our hands on this. All of, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? No, no, and I think the court reporter should put down who's in favor and who's not. I think she did with the eyes and the nose. So. Okay, great. Uh, congratulations. Well, well, thank you. And, and Mr. Hargis, do we need separate motions for the separate since they were actually two? I do, please. That is a darn good point. Uh, is for the second, for the second case, which I believe is 45, I would move that uh, the board find that the zoning administrator acted in error. Is there a second? I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed? No. Okay, you win that one as well. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. And with that, the Board of Zoning Appeals is adjourned today. Oh, uh, well, members, what are we doing for, ourselves with all this? Time? Members, if I could, before. <laughs> Members, before y'all depart, um, by our rules, we have officer elections in May. Uh, the way our schedule has fallen, we will not have but one May hearing as May the 17th. So at our next meeting, that is our next meeting, uh, we need to have nominations for both chair and vice chair. Uh, and at some point later this year, we need to talk about some amendments to our, our rules, but that's not up next time. But uh, I just want you all to think on your own about nominations for uh, chair and vice chair uh, coming up at the next meeting. Thank you. With that, we are adjourned.